Grace, mercy, and peace be to you in the name of our triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is paradoxically both one of my favorite and least favorite Sundays of the church year. It's one of my favorites because this is the one Sunday we get to read the whole Athanasian Creed like we just did, and I'm a theology nerd, so that makes me happy. On the other hand, this is the one Sunday in the liturgical calendar dedicated to a theological doctrine rather than a specific historical event or at least a season based around that event. And it's hard to preach on doctrine because they're usually not just in one text. You have to pull from lots of different texts and see how they fit together. That's how doctrine is formed, and yet I'm preaching on one text, and of course that doctrine is the Trinity. As the saying goes, starting a sentence with the Trinity is like is the theological equivalent of saying, hold my beer and watch this. It's like I said, the Trinity is one of those great divine mysteries that is just beyond our ability to fully comprehend. You know, we know God is three. Scripture repeatedly tells us to think of him as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Trisagion of Isaiah 6 and other passages assert, you know, three is the number for God. At the same time, we know there's only one God. That's the hallmark of God's people throughout the whole Bible. They, the Jews, have been strict monotheists ever since God revealed himself to them. I know the, that today's Jewish religion is technically different than biblical. That's a whole sermon in and of itself. But their highest prayer in their liturgies comes from God's declaration in Deuteronomy 6. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. God is three. God is one. How does that work? I don't know. Those who historically have tried to say they knew how it works, to try to explain it in a way that makes sense to human reason, are denounced as heretics throughout history with fancy names such as modalists or Arianists or partialists. There's a video I posted on our Facebook page today you can watch that talks about some of those. So we can say the Trinity is not those things. We can say what the Trinity is is not. We had that in the, in the Athanasian Creed. You know, there's not three gods. There's not three infinites. But when we have to say what it actually is, well, that creed is the best we can do, and I think we can all admit it's a little bit confusing, and none of us really understand it. All right, so let's turn to the text for today and see if that can help. Our epistle reading for the day, it's from the book of Acts, not an epistle, but oh well. It is a continuation of Peter's Pentecost sermon from last week, where he's again expanding on how Jesus fulfills the prophecies of the Old Testament while attesting to his divinity. Now, even though we're starting in the second half of a sermon, he's still following a nice law of gospel structure that we Lutherans love so much. So he starts in today's text by calling the crowd's attention once more to Jesus as the center of God's revelation to humanity. He reminds them all, all the miracles Jesus performed, or as John calls them, signs, to verify he did indeed come from God. He is authorized to speak for God. Now, some of that crowd probably witnessed at least one of the miracles, but they all would have at least heard about them from other eyewitness testimonies. But after establishing that, the hammer of the law comes down. This Jesus, who did prove he is from God and has the God-given authority to speak according to these signs and wonders because how else could he cast out demons and heal the sick and command the weather and raise the dead if you were not from God? You killed him. Painfully and excruciatingly, you nailed him to a cross. If not you personally, then you through the hands of lawless men who gave in to your demands upon Pilate who wanted to release Jesus because he found no guilt in him. And of course, we being theologians, we can dig a little bit deeper, and we know that we can also apply this indictment to us. You know, the crowd may not have been present for the trial, but they still killed our Lord. We weren't even born then, but we killed him. Because we know that Christ, the righteous one, died for the sake of the unrighteous. It was the sins of humanity, not the hands of Roman soldiers, who nailed him to the tree. All of us 
bear that guilt of Adam. All of us bear the curse of Genesis chapter 3. All of us are culpable for his death. You know, there's a reason why after Peter finishes this sermon at the end of chapter 2, the crowd's immediate response is terror, saying, what shall we do? What can we do after such a crime as putting our God to death? After committing the apostasy that not only denied his divinity, but sought to do away with him because we didn't like what he said. Or for us readers today who know that he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and then we turn and follow our own sinful desires rather than keeping his commandments, knowing full well what he has done for us. We who try to put him back on the cross to enable our own selfishness, what are we to do? When they heard this, they were cut to the heart indeed. Well, if you were to read on for those last few verses in chapter 2 where the lectionary cuts off today, you would see Peter points them back to the same gospel he's about to proclaim in this part of his sermon. Even though the unbelieving masses had Jesus put to death, by their own sins, by the demands of Pilate, by their own attempts to stone him in the days leading up to Holy Week. The fact of the matter is Jesus did not stay dead. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. So once more, I know we're technically not in the Easter season anymore, but alleluia, Christ is risen. For indeed, Jesus is the promised Messiah, prophesied throughout all of the Old Testament. Here, Peter attests to them the words of David in the Psalms, that though Jesus was the son of David, he is still David's Lord. He sits at God's right hand, and he was David's source of hope and comfort and assurance all throughout his life. Jesus is that rock which cannot be moved. He is the one whose presence made David glad in all of his Psalms of praise. He is the all-conquering one who shall not be defeated. And yes, even David, greatest king in Israel's history, he still died. He is buried. His body remains today. But Jesus Christ, who is the greater king, he died, but he rose again. His body is not here, but he now sits triumphantly on his heavenly throne. All enemies have been placed beneath his feet. God the Father has declared him to be Lord and Christ, Yahweh and his anointed one who has ascended to heaven. But he is not a vengeful God, at least not in the way we might expect. He did not ascend to heaven so that he could rain brimstone down upon us sinful humans who put him to death. Rather, he remains gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So he sends not judgmental fire, but the fire of his Holy Spirit. His blessing is poured out amongst the people so that they may see his work in the world, not only in the tongues of flame that appeared above their heads on Pentecost, but in the very fact that Peter is now emboldened to stand up and preach the good news of God in courage and truth. The Holy Spirit has enabled these apostles to become the foundation of the church so that all the world may know who Jesus is and what he has done for all of us, that he has restored us to the Father, that he has made forgiveness available. To all who believe. So that then we, like that audience in Acts 2, ask, What shall we do? We hear the eternal gospel. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom our Lord God calls to himself. I suppose the elephant of the room of today is still somewhat unaddressed. I mean, yes, we've had the three persons of the Trinity mentioned throughout the sermon, but we haven't really gotten that full explanation we would hope for. We, have, you know, we just we could have gone with a gospel reading where, again, we get the names, we get that we're baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but we don't really get a nice systematic explanation of what we mean when we say we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in Unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance or you know, how is it that the Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, the Holy Spirit is Almighty, and yet there are not three Almighties, but one Almighty? This remains confusing. As frustrating as that may be, I'm okay with it. 
I'm okay with accepting it's a divine mystery we'll never fully understand in this life. We may not even fully understand it in the next. We don't always understand how God works. But what this text does make clear to us is that even if we can't comprehend the unfathomable nature of the Godhead, We know that the three persons of the Trinity are united in will and purpose, and that purpose remains as God's desire that all should come to a saving faith in him to be restored in our relationship with him and to dwell with him forever in the new heavens and the new earth. Just as Peter invokes all three persons in this sermon on Pentecost, the birth of the church, so too do we now get to recognize that every week when we gather under that same invocation of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are doing so to give thanks to the Father for Christ's salvific act for our sake, acknowledging that all of this is revealed to us by the Holy Spirit, the author and perfecter of faith, who works through word and sacrament by which we make up the divine service. Every Sunday is a Trinitarian celebration for us. So we see in our readings today, the three in one has been present Ever since the beginning, as we heard in the Old Testament reading of creation, there's a reason God speaks in the plural, and he says, let us make man in our image. The Father created the world through the word by the act of speaking, and John 1 tells us Jesus is the word, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. We saw in the Gospel reading today that the three-in-one was present in baptism when you were brought into those promises of God's grace and mercy that he has given to his church, baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so our reading from Acts then assures us that the three-in-one remains with us now and throughout eternity to do his strange work, to kill us and make us alive, to condemn us with the law, like Peter does at the start of the reading, in order to bring us about to repentance, where we receive life in his name, as Peter promises by the end. So how is it that Jesus is God and yet he sits at God's right hand? Don't ask me to explain it. I kind of can, but that would take about three hours and we don't have time for that today. I'm just going to take it on faith that God knows what he's talking about when he reveals these things through his words. I'm going to trust that he's correct even if I can't make sense of it. Because I can make sense of what is required to know of him. What he has revealed to us clearly and distinctly that God loves us, He created us, he died for us, and he has called us all to be with him as his own. And he, in his infinitely incomprehensible majesty, deigns to care about each one of us individually. So he is the Lord, and he is the Lord's anointed, and he is the Lord's helper sent forth to bring you into a saving faith in him. He has done what is necessary. He has done the work to earn our salvation. So believe and trust in him, even if it doesn't fully make sense to your finite brain. So that just as Christ was raised from the dead, you too shall be raised to a newness of life. May the peace of that triune God, which surpasses all understanding in more ways than one, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until the life everlasting. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Please rise as you are able.